quick question before we get started here. It's a simple one. We have the answer. We won't always divulge it, but no show of hands is required for this. How important is Bible reading to you? Do you know how important it is to God? that you read it and understand it. Notice what Solomon says in Psalms 43. Psalms 43, verse three. Send forth your light and your truth so that they may guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain and to your dwelling places. From there, we go to the longest psalm there is. Psalms 119. It's a long but fascinating psalm in that it is actually a poem. Its structure is in 11 and 117 verses. And it is the longest book in the Bible. Appropriate would <laughs> I settle on that one in my present state, but sometimes things can't be avoided. The 176 verses are divided into 22 stanzas. One stanza for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Beginning with the Aleph and ending with the Tau. Within each stanza, each of the eight verses begins in a Hebrew letter with that letter. Those who no Hebrew, read along. Everyone read along anyway. So for the verses he used, I have also included the English version of that Hebrew letter. Starting with Psalms 119.97. Mem, meaning of that word, continuity of life, here and beyond here. Interesting start. Even the longest book in the Bible says that there is something beyond here. And notice the first subject of the longest version of the verse in the Bible. What it meditates on. But oh how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies. For they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged. Because I have kept your precepts. I have refrained my feet from e every evil way that I might observe your word. Can't serve two masters at the same time. Amen. I have not 
turned aside from your ordinances. For you have taught me how sweet are your words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. 105, the word none. Regeneration or continuity of life. There's a constant theme here of regeneration. In the longest verse in the Bible. <laughs> Thy word is a lamp onto my feet yes. and light onto my path. The Bible is more than a book of instruction. When read properly, it'll change your worldview. Which should give that view deeper roots. Something that the world seems to lack severely right now. The world is changing quickly and not in a way that is very agreeable to anyone who tries to live a life of faith. Much less to Yahweh and Yeshua. But if we read it regularly with the guidance of the Holy Spirit within us, God's word will change your life view. And your life view is slightly different, least it should be, than your world view. Your worldview is how you see the world and how you feel about it. If you are examining your life properly, your worldview is bound to change drastically as your understanding of Elohim's word and will become clearer to you. And the changes you make in your worldview based on your faith will cause you to look around the world and ask three very important questions about this world. One, how did we get here? What happened to us to flummox things this badly. In other words, how did everything get this messed up? Or how is there, why is there so much pain and suffering in this world that he created? And finally, you ask the third question, which is, properly answered with a proper attitude toward and a regular study of this word. How can this mess be corrected? This is a long study. This is a one part of three sermons. Some will remember it, some won't. The third question, and it's biblical answer, if your studying is serious and your life is changing in the response to what the spirit is exposing you to, will alter your life view. A life view is a bit different, or at least should be, than your worldview. It is more personal than a life view, this worldview. But it is uniquely 
yours. As you look at the world, you see things as the world sees that they are. But as Yahweh's word teaches you that this is not the way they should be. And you make a couple of important changes in your life at this point. The selfishness and self-centeredness placed in you by our first parents, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, not Steve. Well, I went there and I won't they stay there long. And they wouldn't have either if he had made that mistake. Adam and Steve would have not been able to recreate themselves. And within one generation, all life will end on this planet. That's all. That's all. That's not what happened. But the selfishness and self-centeredness they placed in you will begin to fade away. It'll happen suddenly, as some Christians believe it does. It doesn't happen all at once. But this change is a lifelong transformation. In that first, first phase of selfishness, spiritual ignorance, myopia, and as set in motion by Satan the devil, we don't realize our problem immediately. This life story will give you some idea of what part of our problem is at this point. A hungry mouse looked through a crack in the wall to see a farmer and his wife opening a package. What food might this contain, the mouse asked. He was aghast when they unwrapped a mouse trap. Retreating to the farmyard, the mouse proclaimed warning. There's a mouse trap in the house. There is a mouse trap in the house. Y'all. The chicken plucked, clucked and scratched his head a little bit and said, Mr. Mouse, I can tell you that this is a grave concern to you, but it is not of much consequence to me. I cannot be bothered with it. The mouse then turned to the lamb and said to him, there's a mouse, there's a mouse trap in the house. The lamb sympathized similarly, but I'm very sorry, Mr. Mouse, sympathized the lamb, but there is nothing I can do. You've heard this before. I'll pray for you. <laughs> Be assured that you are in my prayers. The, how, the, how, the, the mouse turned to the cow, who replied, like, wow, Mr. Mouse, uh, Mousetrap, am I in danger? Duh. <laughs> almost. Almost always the cow is the slow one in these tales. We might one day find out that that's true or not. 
like, like, wow, Mr. Mouse, he said. A mouse trap? Am I in danger? Duh. So the mouse returned to the house, head down and dejected, to face the mouse trap all alone. That very night, a sound was heard throughout the house, like the sound of a mouse trap catching its prey. The farmer's wife rushed his hand to see what she caught. In the darkness, she did not see that it was a venomous snake whose tail got caught in the moss trap. The business end was loose. The snake, thrashing itself to free itself in anger, bit the farmer's wife. The farmer rushed her to the hospital. She returned after a day or two with a fever. That's a little long for a fever. Now everyone knows that you treat a fever with what? Chicken soup. So the farmer took a hatchet to the farmyard and sought his main ingredient, a chicken. His wife's sickness continued. That two days for a fever concerned me. And that concern was well placed. His wife's sickness continued that friends and neighbors came to sit with her around the clock to feed them he butchered a lamb. The farmer's wife did not get well. In fact, she died. And so many people came for her funeral the cow was slaughtered to provide meat for all of them to eat. So the next time you hear that someone is facing a problem and you think that it doesn't concern you, remember that when the least of us is threatened, we are all at risk. First Corinthians, the t 12th chapter, the 12th verse. For as the body of one is, the body is one and has many members and all the members of that body being as one, our one body as also is Messiah. For also, by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether bond or free, even all were made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. But the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? It thinks so, but live on a little bit. 16, and if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is therefore not of the body? Might think so, but live a little bit. 17, if all the body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If all hearing 
where would be the smelling? That was a kind of acute one to me, but after the stroke, I can't smell anything anymore. Y'all don't know that, but you do now. 18, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where would be the body? But now indeed many are the members, yet only one body. Even that is breaking up now. Many of us will have one thing different and can't assemble together anymore. That's not what he intended. But at the same time, though, false unity is just as bad. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. But rather, the members of the body seeming to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable. On these, we put more abundant honor around them. And our unpresentable members have more abundant propriety. Why? Because some of us need more attention than others. They have been harmed more by this life but are still necessary to attend to by others who have been harmed in similar ways. That's why we come together, not so much to need each other, but to learn how to need each other. Twenty-four, for our presentable members have no need, but Elohim tempered the body together, giving more abundant honor to the members having need, that there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with them. If one member is glorified, all the members rejoice with them. And you are the body of Yeshua and members all in part, your part. Your part is just as important as my part. Anybody else? Moving at the pace of your study and obedience to God, no matter how good we think we are, becoming in this way of life, changes will be made in you. However long you've been here. Rashida is last. Melina is first. Both of them have learning to do. Both of them. Enough said there. Matthew 
the sixth chapter, the 23rd verse, the 22nd verse. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. But if your eye be evil, your whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness. Title, let your eye be single. That word single is simple, but Yeshua's use of it reaches farther than it may first appear. Luke, the 11th chapter, the 33rd verse. No man, when he has lighted a candle, puts it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when the eye is single, your whole body also is full of light. When your eye is evil, your body is also full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in you be not darkness. If your whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light. As when the bright shining of a candle gives you light. The word single, as explained by Strong's word G573, haploos, a feminine neutral noun meaning single, i.e. not complex, following a straight line. Use used of the eye as not seeing double. You have two eyes. There, a, a mechanism is set forth why you see one image. <clears throat> that everybody doesn't see that way. there is a thing called parallax error. A lot of people have this. Everything is seen double. Anybody that has drunk <laughs> has seen this way sometimes. That's why the Bible does say that you don't get drunk. I'm not asking anybody anything, anybody, to, don't volunteer nothing. But that's what you see when you're drunk. Parallax error. That's when the disease of the eye is so much that it's trying to set the two points in line, but can't do so. Drugs will do this also. When the eye accomplishes its purpose of seeing things as they are, that is healthy, perfect, in singleness, simplicity, absence of fold, seeing things as they are, scripturally and otherwise. 
this. Not as we want to see them, but worse, as the world says they are. <laughs> no. As the eye says they are, when it's single. Everyone you know has a set of beliefs that they filter everything seen through in this world. Their lives, this world, be they political, philosophical, or even sacred or religious. This is why there's so much confusion in the world now. All who are outside of Yahweh's way are just bouncing through life with no true concept of what life is. For those with a set of beliefs, this set of beliefs is the basis from which they move and breathe and interpret everything that happens to them personally and everything that happens in the world they observe every day without the Holy Spirit's interference. And to them, it is interference. Let's say, for example, you are an atheist and you do not believe that there is a creator God that interacts with his creation through a spiritual component placed in them through a process. You have a worldview that now shapes how you interpret the events in your life, be it your atheism, agnosticism, flawed religion, whatever. For instance, as an example, so, so suppose your best friend dies in a car crash because you believe that all of us have come into being as a process called Darwinian evolution You accept that perceptive thing that in you that says that we are a product of random chance occurrences over incredibly long periods of time. In fact, everything in your world is a product of this random chance, including the destinies of each of us individually. Your friend's death is a random accident in a series of random events that somehow, all within the context of this random universe and disorder resulted in that bit of chaos. Not only is your friend's death accidental, their very life was accidental. No form, no plan, no eventual destination. You have never considered the words of God because you have never heard them. The worldview, however, affects the way you interpret this death. From your perspective, as an atheist, life is relatively meaningless to begin with. It is, after all, merely the product of random chance and unguided forces. There is no meaning in his death because there really was no meaning in his life. All of it was random, all of it accidental. A very dark, dismal view. 
but one that I believe is the cause of most of our mall shootings, mm -hmm. drug use, mm -hmm. abhorrent sexual practices. And believe me, Mr. Epstein was the top of a very large iceberg beneath the surface. We'll, we will never, well, challenge you on this. Get to the great white throne judgment and you'll get the rest of the story. <laughs> That's the only way that will come out. And anybody that's worked in the uh, prison system knows how hard it is to get somebody to off themselves. Has $500 million in the bank to get himself out. We don't ever want to know in this life what happened because that knowledge might get you killed. But I challenge you today, make it to the white throne judgment and we will see that person punished. On to the next thing. And I believe, again, the mall shootings, drug use, abhorrent sexual practices, we went there already, the general anger, hate, confusion, sadness in the world right now among people who accurately believe and perceive that things are not going well in this world. A world that they feel trapped in. I heard somebody once speaking of Earth as a prison planet. Alex Jones, I think it was. Prison planet, that's what he calls it. We're trapped in it never being allowed to make a decision about its direction. But who does have ultimate control? Isaiah, 40th chapter, the 12th verse. Who has measured the waters of the sea in the hollow of his hand? and marked off the heavens by the width of his hand? Who has enclosed the dust, the dust of the earth in a measuring bowl, or weighed the mountains in the scales and the hills in the balance? Who has fathomed the spirit of Yahweh, or as his counselor has taught him, With whom did he consult to enlighten and instruct him on the ways of paths of justice? Or who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of wisdom? No one on this earth. That's why it says this in Isaiah 55th chapter, the eighth verse. Isaiah, the 55th chapter, the 8th verse. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your thoughts or your ways my ways, declares Yahweh. For just, just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts 
than your thoughts. Just as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, yielding seed for the grower, for the sower, and bread for the eater. So will my message be that goes out of my mouth. It won't return to me empty. The first time or two you might ignore it, but learn from it, eventually you'll start listening. Not all at the same time, but you will start listening. It won't return to me empty. Instead, it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. For you will go out in joy and come back with peace. From where? The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees in the fields will clap their hands. This, on the other hand, is the mindset of believers. Our beliefs about God are fundamental and led through this lens through which we interpret and view the world. Our faith is our worldview. When our friends die, we believe our friends lives have incredible meaning because we all were created by a living, loving God who knows our name and he doesn't know them because he owns cheers. He knows our names. When our friends die, we believe our friends die. Friends' lives have incredible meaning because we all were created by a loving, loving God who knows our names and is still involved in the daily activities of our lives to the degree that we actively participate in his plan of God in obedience, faith, and humility. As a result, if our friends die in car accidents, our worldview as believers moves us, as moves us to try to interpret this event from Yahweh's perspective. We cannot simply throw up our hands and see the event as some random event or come some cosmic accident. Although the Bible plainly says that because of our freedom of choice, Yahweh is bound to allow certain things to happen because of the f bad choices of the principles. And sometimes the results have effects far beyond the lives of the, of the people involved. Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 9-11. Don't ignore these little things. What we, the world celebrates this weekend, line 11. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor the bread to the wise nor yet riches to the men of understanding, nor yet favor to the men of skill, but time and chance 
happens to them all. Ephesians, the first chapter, the eighth chapter. Ephesians 1, the eighth chapter. First chapter, eighth verse. Ephesians, the first chapter, the eighth verse. Which he calls to abound in, toward us in all wisdom and understanding. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which He calls to abound in us in all will and understanding. That, that's what happened. Having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in himself for an administration of the fullness of time to head up all things in Yeshua, Messiah. Both the things in heaven and the things on earth, even in him, in whom also we have been chosen to an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of his will. Him who works all things according to the counsel of his own will. For in the comprehensive plan of Elohim, there will be a logical conclusion which will be favorable to all in the end. While we may never have the answer for why the specific event happened, our faith allows us to understand the plan within the plan of God. All is not lost. We will see them again. We will grieve. We will miss them and go through all the pain associated with that. But we will not feel the helplessness of a non-believer or one whose beliefs are at variance with the true word of God and sees the end of life as the end of our existence in God's plan. First Thess Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, the 13th verse. First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, the 13th verse. But we do not want, to, want you to be ignorant, brothers, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve like other people who have no hope. For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, even so through Yeshua, God will bring those back who have died with him. Yeshua even had to deal with this personally to teach us all this process. Notice what happens with his friend Lazarus in John the 11th chapter, the 21st verse. Martha told Yeshua, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even I know, however, that you ask of God, he will give it to you. Martha had faith. 
she would soon have certainty. Yeshua told her, your brother will rise again. Martha told him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Yeshua told her, I am the resurrection and the life. The person who believes in me, he, even though he dies, will live. Indeed, everyone who lives and dies and believes in me will never die. Do you believe that? Yes. That says rabbi there, and we don't use that. Yes, Lord. We don't always use that either, but something had to be there. Yes, Rabboni. She told him, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who was to believe, who was to come in the world. When she said this, she went away and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and calling for you. As soon as Mary heard this, he, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Yeshua had yet, not yet arrived at the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews had been with her, consoling her in the house, sent Mary up quickly and come out. And there, and they followed her, thinking that she had gone to the tomb to cry there. As soon as Mary came to where Yeshua was and saw him, she fell down at his feet and told him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not have died. Yeshua saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying. She was greatly troubled in spirit and greatly moved. He asked, where have you put him? They told him, Lord, come and see. Yeshua burst into tears. He cried first of all over their grief. Then the grief of all their friends. As they also cried for Lazarus. But he also grieved over the faithlessness cast out by them by the errant lies of the Pharisees. 37. So the Jews said, see how much he loved him? But some of them said, surely the one who opened the eyes of the blind man could have kept this man from dying. Couldn't he? People still follow these people. Groaning deeply again, Yeshua came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was laying in front of it. Yeshua said, remove that stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, he had been there a while now. A stench by now is there because he's been there for four days. Yeshua told her, I told you that if you believed, you would see God's glory, didn't I? 
by faith in Yeshua in obedience to the plan of Yahweh. A way is offered to restore all believers forever if we accept it. The world refuses to accept it. I had a guy in here the other day and went through all of this. And he got to the point about believing in coming back from the dead. And the man that so adroitly fixed our clock couldn't believe that. Couldn't believe it. And I left him there. I didn't go in on him. He will one day believe. When he sees it. The world refuses to accept this fact. In fact, they laugh at it. And he did. Yet they believe in an invisible man throwing a ball of gas into an invisible nothing and exploded it, that nothing into a universe so precisely ordered in chaos that you can set your clock by it and chart a calendar from it after all these years. Yet, they don't believe in a God of order. <laughs> they will. Soon enough. In the end, I suppose it all depends on what you believe. And why you believe in it. I believe that there are answers to our three questions. And those answers will crystallize our belief in God Almighty and his plan of salvation. Let's begin with that first question. How did we get here? And stop there. And come back next week for more.